Good evening, brother. All right. Hey, okay. I was muted. Uh, Keith, are there you familiar? You if, are you familiar with a video that's been passed around that the guys by a swimming pool talking about uh, getting uh, setting up and sending in your birth certificate to the treasury? Have you seen that video? Uh -uh. Okay. What kind of swimming pool are we talking about? We're talking about, about a pretty big. Yeah, pool. yeah, yeah. It's a real big swimming pool guy sitting there talking about it. And it's Raymond D. Gion is who's doing it. Do you know that guy? <coughs> I, I don't want to talk about this on the recording. But right. I, we need to do this in private because yep. it's, it's very bad. Okay. What do, you, what do you mean bad? The, uh, the birth certificate situation? The information in the guy, he's a con artist. I don't want to promote him. Yeah, there's a lot of them out there. It's always yeah. good to keep an eye on them. Yes, and that's, you know, it's a shame. Yeah. Well, it's one of the first things I look at, despite despite the fact that I've got a PayPal link, it's the first thing I look at when people start claiming this and that and, and charging for classes and stuff. I don't, these aren't classes. These are research sessions. You guys are involved in the research with me. I give you all the links so you can do your own research. And then later on, we're going to be discussing the same stuff that we're going over first initially that so we can set out a confirmed plan so that everybody can learn how to reorganize you know, settle all the accounts and then merge and reorganize under a new name. Okay. And all right. Cause all about, it, it's all about revocation, restoration, removal, redemption. Right. That's, it is a simple way to remember it. And tonight we're going to go over some things to, uh, help point people out in the direction that I'm going. I'm going to talk a little bit about my companion situation in regards to uh, the first link we're going to talk about tonight. So, okay. That sounds good because there, there's, you know, the, the 24 hour zoom call there was, there was just, it seemed like it started out excellent. And then it got to where there's just these con artists coming on there trying to sell disinformation. And that's, and, and you'll notice none of them bring the information I'm bringing. None of them. None of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and it's, it's not, I'm, I'm not trying to boast because all glory goes to him. He's the one that tells me, keep following this line, no matter what you research on either side of it, keep following this line. And so that's what I'm doing because I realize that everything they've done today is, uh, is a conversion and, it all operates under the same way, like I said the other night in, in session 14, that uh, 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 developing countries use a transitional credit. And that goes on for years. And they do so by invoking a bankruptcy. So all we're doing is the same thing. What we want to do effectively is operate the same way the Treasury wants us to. And that is we're going to get rid of the definitive paper form and do everything by book entry, which is electronic. But in order to do that, we have to be careful of how we're entering these things that we're entering. We have to know what it means. And that's taking over those electronic NIAX codes, developing your virtual private networks with dot post domains, pure and simple. That way you can, you can uh, connect work with each other privately. And it, it all has to do with electronic export information as data elements, which are keys that are numbered, uh, numbered to press numbered keys or other identifiers that are then entered into 
the automated electronic system and captured by automated commercial environments. And so it's important that we secure the information we're putting out there and it's not export information. It's not being entered into the commercial environment. It's, it's entered into the electronic system, but the commercial environment can't touch it. And that's what we're doing. See, and then we know how, we have one document, one port of entry on the, on the virtual network, which is World Wide Web. This is international access. And so it's, it's starting at that point and in getting your international recognition in the electronic form and then fixing that form and perfecting that form is the, is the route that I'm posing. Everybody else has got everybody filing these documents into court. Those documents eventually get transferred to electronic book entry. So in that transfer, they're further conveying them to their own advantage. So we're going to start up here at the electronic form and establish ourselves electronically on the international level and then fix everything down below that. We're going to let that truth trickle on down, let the roots grow down into everything. Uniform throughout all jurisdictions, rather than letting everything start up here at the, at the paper level with the signature and then try to sprout off the paper and, and twisting you up in all kinds of jurisdictions that you don't need to be involved in. Because we see that that paper gets transferred from this jurisdiction to this jurisdiction to this jurisdiction. Same thing happens in the electronic environment, guys. And so what we're going to do is get one port of entry. What's happening now is that those papers that are getting transferred in this, they're all entering them into the electronic system at their ports as well. So one paper gets started out here, gets entered into this, this electronic port. Automated commercial environment here. They're going to make some money on it gets transferred over here, gets entered into this automated um, commercial environment in the automated electronic system as an electronic export information that they're going to make, make some money off. Everybody's entering. Well, we're going to quit that. We're going to quit that. So tonight, oops, let me get my page set up. The very purpose of me talking about the post office and doing everything there. This is 39 CFR 777.33. Expenses incidental to transfer of title to the postal service. And before we go further, you remember me talking to everybody about the uh, post office. All those postal workers are warrant officers with secret security clearances. They're, they're by their customs clearance officers. And it says definition of land warrant, a transferable certificate from the land office, from the land office, authorizing a person to assume possession of a specified quantity of public land. So these are the people we're going to negotiate with once we perfect that bond and get the medallion stamp banker to um, stamp that sucker. We're going to put a value on it. And then we're going to go to the land office and we're going to get their, their authorization to assume possession of a specified quantity of public land. And in that, those agreements, those negotiations, international negotiations, peace treaties, we're going to make um, assignment to the postmaster to take that title. We're going to be working with the Forest Service through the uh, Department of Agriculture, um, which is where the farm credit extends from. And this is our transitional credit in redeeming the land because we're gonna take it out of agriculture and we're gonna put it into conservation. There's, other, there's two other classes besides agriculture, conservation and, and forestry, which is timber work, which is what we saw in that uh, video Derek showed us one time where the guy was claiming timber rights. He didn't want his land, he just wanted the timber rights in perpetuity. So expenses incidental 
Well, when we do the chapter 15 bankruptcy, we're clar we're clarifying not that not necessarily that we're bankruptcy, but that there's a discrepancy in value systems. They are foreign, foreign value systems. Therefore, your assessment may be accurate, but it needs to be converted. It's now time to do the conversion. Age of majority, power, or uh, uh, age of discretion, however you want to claim that. Um, uh, revocation of the powers of attorney, restoration of durable powers of attorney, in fact, to make your own governing decisions in plenipotentiary and, uh, matters, period. Everything you do, whether they discern it as banking or trust or commerce or transport, I don't care what you define it as. Nate, none of your business. These are my affairs. <coughs> so anyway, it says expenses incidental to transfer of title to the postal service. So when we transfer that title, what we're doing is at the same time setting up that irrevocable letter of credit based on their duty to protect internationally protected persons. They now have an internationally protected person in their custody under an assignment as trustee on the international level as a secret security officer. When property is acquired through the exercise or the threat of the exercise of eminent domain, the owner shall be reimbursed for all reasonable expenses he or she necessarily incurred in conveying the real property to the postal service. Four, recording fees, transfer taxes, documentary stamps, evidence of title, boundary surveys, legal descriptions of the real property, and similar incidental expenses. However, the postal service will not pay costs solely required to perfect the owner's title to the real property. That's why I say we have to perfect the title first through that, that medallion stamp banker and then present it to the land office and then do the assignments from there. Incidental. Penalty costs and other charges for prepayment of any pre-existing recorded mortgage entered into in good faith encumbering the real property. So when we redeem the land, this is why I'm telling you guys, you got to quit going after these people and trying to sue them. It tells us right there, penalty costs and other charges for prepayment of any pre-existing record or recorded mortgage entered into in good faith encumbering the real property. You can't deny that it was entered into in good faith. The people that entered it, they were in cognitive dissonance as well. You cannot prove that they did it by intent of fraud. You cannot prove that. So you must admit that they entered it into good faith. Admitting this and saying, I forgive you as you forgive me means an equal ledger, folks. You cannot come into equity expecting the effect of equity by posing some kind of off balance, out of balance. You cannot do that. You have to pose that, yes, there is a balance. And you agree, it should be balanced, but here's where it's out of balance. This is what we need to correct, not this. That takes it further out of balance. You gotta be able to discern this stuff for yourself. If you don't know what this stuff means, it's all, it's plain writing, folks. It's plain writing. Conveying she necessarily, reasonable expenses he or she necessarily incurred. In other words, we have to be able to realize that in order to tell these guys to do something, we have to put them to work. They have to be compensated. We have to agree to that compensation. Now, in realizing that, okay, let's compensate them, but let's compensate them through that same transitional credit that we believe in. 
wouldn't that be a better position to compensate them, show them how to do the same thing? See, this is all stuff that's supposed to be done privately anyway, right? Right? So think about this stuff. Um, direct payment, whenever feasible, the po postal service must pay these costs directly and thus avoid the need for an owner to pay such costs and then seek reimbursement from the postal service. As I said, the postal post office is the, the regulatory commission of the, the judicial system, period. They regulate the judicial system. They are the first step of Congress in order to transport it from one jurisdiction from Congress to the other jurisdictions, it has to go through a postal service known as the post office. Certain litigation expenses, we're not litigating. We're correcting records. We're not litigating. Do not let them use that litigation expenses. Uh -uh, we're not litigating. This is Socratic and we're correcting the record. The owner of the real property acquired must be reimbursed any reasonable expenses, including reasonable attorney appraisal and engineering fees. See, again, they're talking um, attorney fees in a private matter. We're not talking about attorneys. They keep wanting to assess some kind of attorney fees to turn things over. I don't have to hand it over to a third party. I will give it to them directly. I don't need your, your interference, your intercedence. 63 M Juris Second, Section 247. Read it, know it. The final judgment. Oh, and here, appraisal and engineering fees, which the owner actually incurred because of a condemnation proceeding. See, this is the only way they can acquire any land is they have to first condemn it. We have to reclaim the land through condemnation of agriculture proving that use of herbicides on the land is destroying the soil. We are here to redeem the soil of the land. Very specific wording, folks, pay attention. The final judgment, everything they've got is a summary judgment. I, I spoke about this. The final judgment of the court is that the postal service cannot acquire real property by condemnation or the condemnation proceeding is abandoned by the Postal Service other than under an agreed upon settlement. I spoke of the land warrant. A transferable certificate from the land office authorizing a person to assume possession of a specific quantity of public land. If it's not registered at the, at the uh, postal, through the post office, Postal Service, it's not a valid land warrant. Not a valid land warrant. If it's registered with, the, registered with the land office, it's still a commercial interest. The court having jurisdiction renders a judgment. That's my court. No one else's. Again, I'm not talking about starting at the bottom with paperwork and working my way up. I'm using the full armor of God and I will speak in the word of God and you can translate it. You can get your stenographer down there and you can have somebody press numbered keys or other identifiers. My yay is my yay, my nay is my nay. I know what I say and I know what you seem to profess. seems impossible and inconsistent in favor of the owner in an inverse condemnation proceeding. Inverse, as opposed to adverse. Inverse, redeeming. Condemnation proceeding for the Postal Service affects a settlement of such proceeding. We're going to condemn the agriculture for destroying the land, the soil of the land. That is our inverse condemnation. Very simple. The next one, in reference to that, when we make that presentation, when we get that medallion stamp um, guarantee to work, 
and we've got a certificate, we can use a carry back and carry forward of unused credit. So now we have to figure out what those unused credits are. Well, like I said, when we figure out the value that we put to it, that's the unused credits. Because everything we've been using here lately is the Federal Reserve notes and, and the assumptions of, of being the creditor. When somebody else is at, actually subrogated the set, its creditor position and is using all the credits and demanding the Federal Reserve notes from us. It's all hinky backwards, folks. So we get that certificate. We endorse it properly with the proper value. Get that medallion stamp um, guarantee. And that's the line of credit. That's a drawdown credit account. Every year it gets zeroed out because everything drawn off of it is a donation. And the organization that's using it and donating it to me kindly, and I graciously accept it as the beneficiary, how would be thy name? And they get to claim it on their taxes every year. 100% deductible goes right back into the same account, balancing it back to zero. No debt, no profit, not meant for either. Meant purely as 100% donations so that everything is accounted for at the end of the quarter or at the end of the year. And it goes back to zero. If it does not back or maintain back to that to that zero point, then there must be another bankruptcy or a point of forgiveness or find out where it's at. Pure and simple. And this is the internal revenue code. This is where everything extends from. They have to tax it first to be able to make a commercial profit on it. One year carry back and 20 year carry forward. Now, I don't care what they say about this because they're putting a time limit on it and fraud has no time limit. Now, again, though they may have done it in good faith, the, the facts on the face of the record show that there is um, and, and uh, definite proof they are fraudulent transactions and weren't meant to be. And therefore, we get to carry back or draw back to our original drawing rights, all kinds of things. In some, in the, if the sum of the business credit carry forwards to the taxable year plus, and again, they're talking taxes. So we're going to extinguish all of this because when we extinguish that debt, when we, when we come to that bankruptcy table to extinguish all the debts, that's what we're doing. We're extinguishing all the debts. Therefore, any kind of new debt must first be initiated by a new tax. Get it? It can't be extenuated from a previous tax from an account that was miscellaneously forgotten and left open. Ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. Nope. A business credit carry back to the taxable year preceding the unused credit year. A business credit carry back to the taxable year preceding. To the taxable year preceding. And this is the wrong verbiage and we can correct that line item through the original taxable year or taxed year whether by uh, uh, whether by knowledge or un uh, unintentionally something to correct that and you get it all the way back and there's people out there doing it a business credit card carry forward of to each of the 20 taxable years following the unused credit year a business credit carry forward Remember, I spoke last time in um, session 14, you're developing countries like Fiji have been going for 10 years and it's not, an, it's not an overnight process. It does take years. So use it. They're telling you right here, 20 years. Okay, I'll take 20 years and I'm gonna make sure that in that 20 years, my successor trustees and beneficiaries, they're all gonna gain this knowledge so they can take, go, take care of that and do another title transfer or whatever they need to, to continue it for another 20 years. However, you need to do it. And subject to the limitations imposed by subsection B. And again, we're, we're exiting this Babylon bullshit. And we're not going to be limitation, limited to impositions by any subsections. 
We're not going to be imposed anymore. We hold our position. We now have standing and we will stay. That is your stay of action. Shall be taken into account under the provisions of Section 38A in the manner provided in Section 38A. So what is 38A? Current year business credit. We're not in business. Get it? Then your business. We're not buying and selling anymore. We're transferring credits through donations, period. Amount carried to each year. We're not carriers. Very important terms. We're not carrier. We're not a carrier. They're transfers, transits, and they're supposed to be taken care of by them. Amount carried to other 20 years. The amount of unused credits for the unused credit year shall be carried to each of the other 20 taxable years to the extent that such unused credit may not be taken into account under Section 38. Again, so if you, like I said, if you can teach your youngers to do the same thing, they could carry it on for the same. And it, if it's working properly, every year it zeroes out. And guess what? That unused credit becomes zeroed out as unused credit again, carried on to the next year and you just keep carrying it on. It's a yearly contract. You just keep carrying it on. Just keep carrying it on. That's the only carry on there is. You're not a carrier. Five year carry back from marginal oil and gas well production credit, uh, da, 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 da. limitations on carry backs. There aren't none. Uh, we're talking about fraud, um, conversion of uh, uh, commercial paper and fiat currency in regards to fiat currency today in the modern form being electronic book entries. Limitation on carry forward. There are no limitations. As long as you know how to contract, you will make it in perpetuity. Your heirs will make it in perpetuity. Transitional rule. I've been telling everybody it's all about transit. D, transitional rule. No portion of the unused business credit for any taxable year, which is attributable to a credit specified in 30 section in section 38B or any portion thereof may be carried back to any taxable year before the first taxable year for which such specified credit or such portion is allowed. And see our, our uh, unused business credit, again, it's not unused business credit, it's just unused credit. We're, we're establishing the transitional credit and it is not business credit, it is transitional credit, pure and simple. So the transitional rule says no portion of the unused business credit. We're not carry for, we're not going to carry forward any business credit. It's transitional carry uh, credit, and it carries carries forward automatically. Automatically. Period. It's operation of law. The next one we want to talk about is powers of the office officers employees of a forest service because this is where we get the land from, the public lands. We don't go into the towns and condemn somebody's house and say, well, we're gonna, we don't wanna live in town anyway, do we? We don't want a little tiny little plot of land. We want out in the big woods and we want some big land. So it's important to know the powers of the officers and employees of the Forest Service. One of their main duties is to protect the land, period, utmost. So we have to make them our friends. For the purposes of section 559B to 559F of this title, if specifically designated by the secretary and specially trained not to exceed 1000 special agents and law enforcement officers of the forest, service when in the performance of their duty shall have authority to carry firearms, conduct within the exterior boundaries of the national forest system, investigations of violations of and enforce section 841 of title 21 and other criminal violations relating to marijuana and other controlled substances, da, da, da. 21 is Food and Drug Administration folks, prohibited acts. Food and drugs. We're not dealing with food and drugs, folks. 
We're dealing in prosperity and abundance. So we're going to let them know. Yeah, we'd appreciate it if you keep your food and drugs off our property. Yep. Keep your food and drugs off our property. And that is 559C. Um, let's see here. What else does it say? Make arrests with a warrant or process for misdemeanor violations or without a warrant or process for violations of such misdemeanors that any such officer or employee has probable cause to believe are being committed in his presence or view or for a felony with a warrant or without a warrant if he has probable cause to believe that the person to be arrested has committed or is committing such felony for offenses committed within the national forest system or with effect the administration of the national forest system. Sounds to me like he's another warrant officer, another inland Marine Corps specialist. Serve warrants and other process issued by court or officer of competent jurisdiction. Search with or without warrant or process any person, place, or conveyance according to federal law or rule of law. Peace. Guess what, folks? We set our rule of law for our property in accordance with that forest ranger that works with us locally. Okay, Keith, does, does that mean that does that mean that we can issue a warrant on somebody that comes on our land? Correct. We are now see we're taking position of a post marshal. And we have great authority over postmasters. And we work with the underlings and they all have their own masters. We are the one that puts forth the commands. They make the demands upon their employees according to the command. See, I'm not under their demand. I'm of command. And so I rise above them and learn this stuff so I can put forth my rule of law according to the principles that are standard doctrines throughout all jurisdictions. And main and foremost one is peace because nobody can sell their commercial wares on the corner if they're being bombed. No one. So they must go in accordance with peace first and foremost. Pure and simple. Seize with or without warrant or process any evidentiary item according to the federal law or rule of law. Again, we're going to, when we develop this trust, we're going to put forth our rule of law. It is going to supersede their federal jurisdictions, period. It's going to be international. When we talk about these federal lands, I want everybody to take a look, and I want to take this time to point out, I've always said Cornell is my favorite site to look up these codes. And that's because Cornell generally puts them in the most plain English and they're the ones that you're going to see will drop out certain sections that are actually going to be found on the congressional record and elsewhere. And so when we look at this 43 U.S. Code, which is public lands, bounty lands. Remember, I was talking about the land warrants. You've got to place a bounty on the land. You've got to put a price on the land in order to have a entry right, in order to enforce your entry right to redeem it. That bounty on the land is your claim that the agriculture is ripe and ready to be maintained or it is being damaged and you need to eject whoever is damaging it and take your sovereign duty to replenish the earth for prosperity and abundance. It's simple language. And this guy here, Cornell, says everything's repealed. And so I want to take this time to point out that this is why we don't limit our research. And when we look something up, we go beyond that first window and look out the first window and say, oh, now I see it. Because you're not looking at the whole picture. You've got to look out the window at the south and at the east and at the north and at the west and all the way around. You got to look everywhere. 
You got to look at both the good evidence and the bad evidence. You got to hear what the lawyers say and you got to hear what the right wing say. You got to hear what the left wing says. You got to be able to discern for yourself. Nothing more, nothing less should you accept. That's what you're worth. Everybody else classifying you, you're not worth that. You're worth so much more beyond every class there is. You have so much more class. It's pathetic. So think about it, folks. So anyway, the importance about looking up other sources. And so when we look at other sources, um, I go beyond and check out um, where it's actually at. And this is the uh, Office of Law Revision Council. Chapter 19, Bounty Lands. Title 43, USC, Chapter 19, Bounty Lands. Office of Law Review, uh, Revision Council. And this has got the public law, provided that sections 457, 473, and 2414 through 2446, inclusive of the revised statutes as amended, are hereby repealed. Repeal of said law shall not affect. Okay, get this? Just because they repealed them does not mean they changed. They just took them off the record. Okay? And this is the important part to understand. Shall not affect the rights of holders of warrants described in section two of this act. That's the land warrants, folks. Until such rights are extinguished. Remember, I told you extinguishing the debts. You're going to extinguish everybody else's claim to the land in accordance with said section to have their warrants receivable. And you have a, re a warrant receivable means it's a receipt, a receipt under 50 USC 4305 for a complete full discharge and acquittance in payment or part payment for lands under the act of December 13th, 1894. Notice how long this goes back, folks. It's repealed, it's removed, it's still there, December 13th, 1894. Supra to assign their warrants. You assign your warrants pursuant to section 2414 and 2444. And the revised statute and to secure a new warrant in lieu of a warrant lost or destroyed. See, if there's no land warrant, then it's lost or destroyed. You're going to secure a new warrant. That's all you got to do. Telling you. Under that warrant, you have a federal tax deduct deductibility, just like I said, 100% return on a drawback, on a drawdown account. Uh, zeroed out every quarter or every year. Federal deductibility, tax deductibility of conservation easement donations. Everything you do is a donation to the conservation easement of allowing that forestry officer to come onto the land and help make sure you are redeeming it appropriately according to the true laws of nature. As you educate each other back and forth in a peace agreement negotiating all the way through. It's never set in stone. You don't have the right to set it in stone. Only he does. And he already has. With that, I yield. I'll post these links and everybody can have fun with them. Make sure to do your research. And um, tomorrow night, we're going to go back and I'm going to start reviewing um, with the question session. So I'm not going to do anything but pull up information that we've already re reviewed according to your questions. So come tomorrow night with questions. Otherwise, it's going to be a sucky Zoom. Get it? Floor is open, guys. Hi, Keith. Postal Prince. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, you know, interestingly enough, the spirit moved me to get on a Zoom call. And um, JW was posting about estate tax and how there's a unified estate business credit tax for publication 950. Have you read that one? Um, no. Because, no, it, because you either. Had, I, I know it doesn't well, apply once I defeat the entire tax treaty. I'm well, the one that gets to impose a tax. But that's what that one is. 
Yeah. So why do I need their form? Can I just say the same well, thing in my own words? Like, yes. I, just, I mean, do you have a right to impose that form to say that you have a right to impose mm -hmm. a tax that I have the same right? Can't we just agree it? Okay. Well, Doesn't well, need to be written down. <laughs> well, I agree that we're not, we shouldn't use their forms, but to read what's in it. But what was in that, yeah. public, that publication was as the owner of the estate, that the debtor, our person, the transmitting utility is to pay taxes back through us to the estate. And um, it's the unified credit. And so, it, and because you're reading from the tax code, I really truly believe after what I read is that it has to do with that. Yeah, and that's, that's basically the same thing we're doing. We're gonna yeah. show that the taxes are just, we're just gonna use, um, when, when we return the receipts, and we get all those credits back. Some of those credits were taken as taxes, like you know, like your local excise tax, seven percent here in Iowa. So every dollar yeah. we spend, seven cents goes towards that excise tax. Well, right. that tax wasn't supposed to be imposed anyway. Well, and, and that's what is then we uh, give them credit by paying them that seven cents, but they have to return that seven cents in credit. So they get it in seven cents in, in the Federal Reserve system which is the Federal Reserve notes and the, the seven penny coins. Right. So that's what that publication did is it described how when people are like third party interloping, how they're standing in the position where we're supposed to be. Right. And so, and so it's what happens then is, is once we get that communication properly with the internal revenue service, then the internal revenue service will go after all those other people who owe the taxes back to us but there, there's all these credits that are already there all right so yeah and so it just described um more and more detail what a lot of what you just read yeah can you imagine how many credits there are with 93 cases here in iowa alone well and this has to do not <laughs> even with this doesn't even have to do with case the cases this literally just had to do with the the uh the exemption, so like not even being able to tax was up to 11.5 million a year. And that's where the like, the callback came from reading this part of it, when you were just reading that, that it started to like sink together that that's what through them, that that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, so, it's, um, it's all done through uh, those fancy little words like we were talking about tonight, the, the drawback and um draw uh -huh. forward and all that you know and that's all about drawing rights you've got yeah. special and drawing rights. Back. yeah and you have the ability to draft a note assigning uh, the drawer as trustee now your yeah. note is a note to the drawer of the instrument that is going to be instrumental in that system your note is not so see that also that also correlates with the trading with the enemy act because we're supposed to to surrender the birth certificate back and everyone's confused about where to do that but i was on a call on sunday night with a woman who said that she took hers and she sent it back to the postmaster yeah. and that all of her bills are paid that way so yeah. maybe instead everyone else is trying to send it to the comptroller they're trying to send it to the county when really um maybe from reading what you just read is that it well, that's not all warrants the information must be warranted otherwise it can't go beyond the port right and this is where we get into the difference between the insular possession and the landed estate yep and how landed estate that's what i'm talking about the land warrant you have to have a land warrant to make the claim that you have a right to possess some land either through being able to condemn it from somebody else that's using it wrongly and therefore you have a right to maintain it to replenish mother earth in other words right. to redeem it for its sinful use or to find some that's not being used that you can make a rightful peaceful claim to right so that then relates to what you're talking about getting a certified warranty dude with their description, as opposed to like say a cadastral description, right? Correct. Correct. See, when when we're talking, what she's yeah. talking about a cadastral um, description 
um, that's more along your longitudes and latitude. And that's when we work, start working with the forestry division because that's what they have out there. Right. And it's a different, it's literally a different jurisdiction. It's actually coming back to the soil. Yeah. And removing, so then, so through the post office and having that account, then when the, say, you know, because my land is 